Cool. So if I was looking at that, it is not a use substitution. This we're going to have to do integration by parts. If that up there had been an x squared, then I could do a u substitution. But as it is written, I'm going to have to do integration by parts. So I would say that I've got a mixture of algebra and exponentials. A comes first in the word late. So for me, u would be x, which makes my du dx. And dv would be everything else, which is e to the negative 2x dx. That makes v negative 1 half e to the negative 2x. And I'm totally happy to show that with a u substitution if anybody needs, um, but that's what we're going to get. Right, so that negative one half is important. And so if we kind of take that and come down here and just think about finding the antiderivative of e to the negative two x dx, I could come off to the side and let u be negative two x, which makes du negative two dx. And I'd have negative one half du is equal to dx. So that's kind of where that negative one half is coming from. That we'd end up with negative one half e to the u du. Yeah. And my guess is if you made a mistake on the problem, it's probably with that negative one half. Yeah. <laughs> that, that would be my prediction. But for completeness, I'll go ahead and finish it off. So I'm going to have um, u times v. So I'd have x times negative one half e to the negative two x minus the integral of v du. So negative one half e to the negative two x dx. And like I do with every integration by parts problem, I take a second to rewrite that. I've got a minus a minus, that'll become a plus. My one half will be out in front. And then we have just completed this integral, which means we already know what it is. So I'm, I'm gonna end up with another negative one half popping out um, e to the negative two X plus the constant. And you could obviously combine those together and make that a negative one fourth, but that would be my answer. Yeah, and like I said, I, I haven't seen the rubric, so I, I cannot guess at what partial credit would happen from that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so being off by those constants is definitely going to cost you some points. I just don't know how many. Yeah. Are there other questions from the exam that anyone would really like to see me work through quickly? I have it in front of me. You're going to have to. E to the negative 3x dx. Cool. So this one is almost the same thing is going to happen as with that e to the negative 2x. So I'm going to jump straight to knowing that this is going to turn into negative one third e to the negative 3x from 1 to 5. Again, same reason. We'd be doing that u substitution, I'm letting u be equal to negative 3x, which makes du negative 3 dx. So I end up with negative one third du equals dx. And then obviously then then plug in the five, subtract off plug in the one. So I'd have e to the negative 15th minus negative one third e to the negative three. Okay. 
And, you know, it's okay to not write out the use substitution on these, but if you're not going to write out the use substitution on these, you really should memorize that sort of the generic integration formula is that e to the ax dx is one over a e to the ax plus c, where a is a constant. Right, and and yeah, if you have it memorized with a equals one, then for anything else you have to do a u substitution. Okay. Yep. Okay. Onward to the use of integration tables. Um. I have a couple of things to say about this. One, if you were taking a different calculus series, like if you were in the 21 series, we would learn more techniques to integrate things. Since you're not, um, if we encounter things that look messier than what we've been dealing with, Often, one of our options is to hope that we can make it look like something in a table of integrals. So let, I'm going to start with something fairly straightforward, and then we'll get more convoluted. Um, sure. So I'm going to start with X over five plus three X squared DX. So for starters, um, if I just walked up to this problem, we do have a technique to integrate this. Does anyone know what we could do? We can definitely do that. We could definitely rewrite that to say x times five plus three x to the negative two. Certainly that's an option. And then technically we could actually do a u substitution on this. It would just be a little bit weird. And I bet we could also get through this as an integration with parts, but I really don't want to do that either. So instead, I'm going to consult our table of integrals. And I'm going to look at this lovely table of integrals. And I'm going to say, hmm. I have something that involves a linear term a plus bu. And in this case, my linear term of a plus bu is 5 plus 3x. Then I'm going to look at my chart and Sorry, it's like cut off onto two pages. I was trying to fit it all on one screen. I probably can't. I'm going to look at my chart at the whole list of things that look like A plus BU and find the thing that matches what I have. And the thing that matches what I have is a single term on top and the bottom is squared. Which means I'm really just matching things up with what's in the table. And if I match things up with what's in the table for equation four, Five is my A, three is my B, U is equal to X, which means DU is equal to DX. And we really just literally plug stuff in from the formula. And we get to say that thing is magically equal to one over B squared times five, over five plus three X plus natural log 
of five plus three X absolute value of all of that stuff plus C. Good times. Now, I don't actually find the integration tables that useful when it's stuff that's just algebra. Where I think the integration tables are great is when we get into fun with square roots and with trig. So I thought we could have some fun with the problems that involve square roots and trig. So um, ooh. I'm gonna do one more example and then we can talk. I'm gonna do one more fairly straightforward example and then we can talk about some particularly less fun ones. Um, I'm going to go with, let's have a square root of e to the 2x minus 4 over, what was I? e to the 2x minus 4 over e to the 2x times e to the x dx. Let's say we weren't trying to use integration tables. Does anyone see a path forward for us? I might, yeah, like I might at least try a u substitution. So one of the things that is kind of a trick anytime we're dealing with e, one of the things that can be super helpful for all of these like rewriting integration problems is to note that when I have e to the two x, that's the same as e to the x whole thing squared. This one can be super helpful. And if I keep that in mind, then my u substitution would probably be that u is equal to e to the two x. du would be 2e to the 2x dx. And then maybe I would be trying to like do something fun with this. And if I tried that, I'm just going to go down the rabbit hole and see what happens, see if anything nice happens. Well, I think I'm already in trouble because this 2e to the 2x dx, I don't have that. I have an e to the 2x on the bottom but I only have an e to the x on the top. So already I'm feeling like this isn't that helpful. So maybe I would try a different u substitution. Maybe I would try letting u just equal e to the x. Now it doesn't feel like it's gonna clean things up quite as much, but at least I know that I have the e to the x dx part. At least I've got my D U. So if I start rewriting this, oh, by the way, there's an excellent suggestion in the chat to do the thing where we multiply the top and bottom by like E to the opposite sign exponents. That's really helpful when I have addition or subtraction um, in either my numerator or denominator, but I don't in this case. So I'm going to stick with this gross u substitution. So on the top, I'm going to use the fact that e to the 2x can be rewritten as e to the x squared to mean that what's inside would become u squared minus 4. What's on the bottom is another u squared. And that e to the x dx, that's my du. Now there are still things that I could do with that, but luckily we're in the section on using integration tables. So I'm gonna to come to the part of my table that has square roots of something squared plus or minus something else squared. 
And if I look at that four, that's a two squared, meaning I've got this thing that looks like the square root of u squared minus two squared all over u squared du. And a quick scan, I need a square root on the top and a u squared on the bottom, squared on the top, u squared on the bottom. There we go. I'm looking at formula 26. Has a square root on the top and a u squared on the bottom. And if I use formula 26 here, my u is e to the x and my a is two. So when I put all of that stuff into our formula, we end up with this integral is equal to negative square root. I'm gonna write it as the formula part first. And then we'll plug in what we have. And now we just plug in what we have. So I'm looking at negative square root of e to the two x minus four plus ln absolute value of e to the x plus the square root of e to the two x minus four plus a constant. In terms of like, you might be asking, what's the point? Um, okay, like, what's the point? I, I would say that the reality is that most of the time, if you really needed to integrate something gross and you were going to use a tool to integrate something gross, you probably wouldn't be looking it up in an integration table. You probably would be putting it into some sort of integrating calculator. Um, so as a tool for things in this class, really, I think it's more to help you practice seeing u substitutions, because most of the stuff that's in the table in order to use it is going to require either a u substitution or completing the square or both in order to like make it through the problem. Question, or did I apply something wrong? So it won't be plus or minus, we select either the plus or the minus. So in our original equation, we have a minus, which means that in the formula, we should follow the minus. Yeah, that's a good question though, yeah. I really have no idea what the homework on this is gonna look like, um, but I might guess that we might have to at least have one problem where we need to complete the square. Would anyone like a little practice on completing the square? Should we refresh our memory on completing the square? Yeah? Okay. So, um, let's see what, I just wanna make sure the formula I wanna use is somewhere in here first because otherwise I'll write a different problem. Wow, that's a very strange version of that formula. Okay. Fine. Formula I wanted to use isn't in here, so I'll just do a different one. Um, okay, here's what we're gonna integrate. I'm gonna integrate one, over x squared plus 8x plus 1 dx. Nope, I lied. That's not a 1. Yes, it is. We'll be OK. It's going to be a little gross. It's going to be a little gross, but this is what we're going to do. So if I walked up to this problem, 
I'd be like, darn, I really hoped there was gonna be a U substitution there. But I would need a two X plus eight or something that kind of looks like two X plus eight on the top. And I don't have it. My next line of defense might be to see if the bottom factored and I could do some kind of creative U substitution. I'm pretty sure that I forced something that does not factor. That was my intent. You can do a quick check, but it's not gonna work. This thing doesn't factor. So the next thing that I'm gonna try is to complete the square on the bottom. So completing the square. When we say completing the square, we mean that rather than factoring this sort of traditionally as something in parentheses times something in parentheses, we are hoping that this can be written as something in parentheses squared plus some leftover number. The way that I approach this is I'm gonna start with that x squared plus eight x and I'm kind of going to move the one off to the side for us. If this part of it is coming from something that's been something times itself or something squared, I'm going to take half of the coefficient on x and that's what ought to be in that squared term. But if I actually multiply this out, I would get x squared plus 4x plus 4x plus 16. By the way, the fact that we get two of the four x's, that's why we had to take half of the coefficient on x. Just bear with me for a second. So, if this had said in the beginning, x squared plus 8x plus 16, that would perfectly factor as x plus 4 whole thing squared. But we didn't have a plus 16. So we're going to fake it. We're going to add 16 in and subtract 16 back off. So when we add the 16 in, that makes the x squared plus 8x plus 16 part turn into x plus 4 whole thing squared. And then we'll combine the original plus 1 with the negative 16 that we added in to be a negative 15. Now I made this a little bit messy because I was having trouble in my head making that come out to be a nice number. It didn't, but that's okay. It's even better for practicing our formulas. So now that we did the completing the square part, I'm gonna flip the page just so I have enough space. And hopefully when I flip the page, I'll do okay. So X plus four squared minus 15. X plus four squared minus 15. If I make a mistake, it's always when I flip the page x plus four squared minus 15. Okay, now I'm coming over to our lovely table of integrals. And it is sectioned off in to these things that say like forms involving. We don't have a square root. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip the square root forms. We do have something that looks like something squared minus something squared. So I am looking at this at formula 21 and formula 21 says the integral of one over u squared and minus a squared du. is equal to one over two a times the natural log of the absolute value of u minus a over u plus a 
plus a constant. So now I just have to take that thing we just did and make it look more like this. Well, the first thing that I'm gonna do is deal with that number hanging off the back and that minus 15. That minus 15 has to match up with the minus a squared. So it is indeed. So my a is radical 15. The next part I'm gonna to have to do is a quick u substitution, but it's not bad, right? If u is equal to x plus four, so I take the part that's being squared, then du is just dx. So we don't have to, there's no dividing by a number, we're just basically ready to go. So I've got my a and I've got my u. Once we've identified a and u, we're just gonna plug it into the formula. So I've got one over two square root 15, natural log, absolute value of x plus four minus square root of 15 over x plus four plus square root of 15 plus the constant. By the way, if you've ever put one of your integrals into an integration calculator and it spit out something totally wacky, it's because those are using these integration tables. Um, that typically is not sort of the answer we might arrive at if we did a lot of algebra by hand, but it is a pretty convenient sort of skip to the final answer approach. Should we practice another one? I don't know how many of these you all wanna do. Yes, I saw a yes. Let's do another one. Let's do one with the trig stuff. Oh, was there any trig on the test? But nothing bad? That's kind of what I figured. Just sign, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, because I like e to the x, no, um, no, let's pick something else. Let's make this look really gross. We're going to have natural log of x sine of natural log of x all over x dx. Angelo, I think you just got a shout out in the chat as a thank you for the list of sine, cosine, no, you're saying no cosine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad it was helpful. Um, okay. So if we take a look at this, we're not going to panic. We're going to say it's gross. I sure hope there's a U substitution. If there's going to be a U substitution, then I'm really hoping that somebody's derivative is hiding in there. And the thing that I can see is that if we let u be equal to natural log of x, then du is one over x dx. I think this is one of the hardest u subs. Well, okay, for me personally, this is one of the hardest u subs to see um, because that division by x doesn't immediately click for me always that that's really supposed to be the derivative of natural log, but it's also a pretty common u sub. So that means that when I rewrite this, this would look like u times sine of u du. Now I'm gonna argue that if that was the problem, we can do integration by parts on that and it's not terrible. Let's practice the integration by parts and then see if we get the same thing that we would get if we used the table. 
do you all want to practice the integration by parts or are you feeling burnt out on math at the moment? Let's do it together. That was the vote. I think that, I don't know. I think the vote was, yeah, integration by parts, baby. Good times. So let's do it together. Um, if I look at this, I've got a mixture of algebra and trig. So I'd come off to the side and I've got, oh, okay. So I don't know if we mentioned this. Sometimes do a U substitution, and then we end up having to do integration by parts. I'm gonna switch the letters around and I'm gonna make these W's because we're doing double integration by parts. No, I don't know. I'm like, I'm calling it W because I just didn't wanna set U equal to U. So U is W, which means my DU is DW. My V is sine of W DW. Sorry, my DV is that, which means my V had to be negative cosine. When I put that together for my integration of parts, I'm gonna have U times V put that minus sign out in front. So I've got minus W cosine W minus the integral of V DU. So negative cosine W DW. And minus a minus, I could write that as plus the integral of cosine W DW. And when we integrate that, The integral of cosine should be sine. And then I can come back to like that original U substitution that we had and turn that into negative ln of x cosine ln of x plus sine ln of x plus a constant. Or Oh, there's a question about how I got, why it was a negative out in front. So I did my W times negative cosine W and I just put the negative out in front. I could have, I could have written it as W times negative cosine. I just combined it. If we go to our lovely tables, and forms involving sine of u or cosine of u. Equation 52 gives us a u sine of u du is equal to sine of u minus u cosine u plus c. In a slower statement, table from the table number 52 gives us the integral of u sine of u du is equal to sine of u minus u cosine u plus c, which is what we just got. We just wrote it in the other order, right? We ended up with our minus u cosine u out in front and then plus the sine of u. So a lot of the things in the table we can get the right answer by U substitution and integration by parts. Some of the things we just really don't have the tools to get through. Um, but having the table at our disposal, you know, would have saved us all of the integration by parts work. So sometimes it's helpful to have. People are still writing, so I'm gonna give it a second, but then I've got a good next one. I've got one in mind. Dun, dun, dun. 
Do you all want an exponential function or some trig? Exponential function? You got it. I'm going to give us an exponential function. Well, I don't have a use substitution because I would need a 2x somewhere. And I don't really have integration by parts either because I kind of don't have two parts. So unfortunately, we can't. So when I have E raised to the X squared, um, like that whole X squared part is in the exponent. So what that would be equivalent to is saying E to the X raised to the X. Because that e to the x squared is saying that I have like e to the x times x as opposed to 2x. Yeah. So there's not really much we can do with that. Well, I'm going to consult our integration table and hope we got something good in here. So forms and trig stuff and more trig stuff and less trig stuff. And we do have a section with some E stuff, but you know what? None of the stuff with E's are gonna help us with this, which is why we might have to use trapezoid or Simpson's rule to do anything with this integral. Now, I know much like the midpoint rule, the book gives us functions that are relatively easy to work with. I just wanted to point out that the reality is the reason that we reach for trapezoid rule or Simpson's rule is when we encounter stuff that we just have no other methods to deal with, right? So this is one where we've already ruled out U sub, we've ruled out integration by parts, we've ruled out using a table. So it's sort of like, now what? What can we do with this? Well, trapezoid rule and Simpson's rule, kind of like the midpoint rule, they don't help us to find the actual antiderivative, but they would help us if we were trying to figure out something like what the integral of e to the x squared dx was from, let's say, 1 to 3. This we would be able to approximate the value of. And so we've already talked midpoint. Have you all talked trapezoid or Simpson's rule in class yet? No, it's coming up. Um, trapezoid or Simpson's. Yeah. Has to be a definite integral. Yep. So all of these tools are for definite integrals. We've kind of run through our bag of tricks for indefinite integrals. This is just the thing that we don't have a way to integrate. I'm looking at the clock. We've got 10 minutes left. I can do more examples. We can get ahead a little bit into trapezoid or Simpson's rule. We can just say 
we're done for the day. How are people feeling? Okay, I've got a couple votes for get ahead, which I'm totally good with get ahead. We can talk a little bit about um, trapezoid and sim control. Okay. This is going to be a really ugly first problem, but I'm gonna do it anyway, because much like the midpoint rule, the hard part is figuring out what the X values are to plug in. Once you've got that piece of it done, the rest of it is really kind of mechanical of just plugging stuff into a formula. I don't really know what e to the x squared looks like, but I do know that the values are always positive. So I'm just gonna draw a fake graph that's kind of e to the x-ish. And I know that the values are always gonna be positive. So I'm gonna give myself axis down here. So let's say that I wanted to approximate this using trapezoid. Cool. Now, just like with the midpoint, I don't, I don't, that does not say trapezoid. Um, just like with the midpoint rule, we have to be given a value of N. We have to be told how many trapezoids we're gonna break this up into. So I'm gonna use trapezoids and I'm gonna let N I'm gonna keep it simple for this first one and I'm just gonna make N equal to two. So I was trying to approximate from one to three. And if my N is equal to two, then I'm just breaking that apart into two pieces. So in terms of the width of each piece, we're gonna do that the same way that we did for the midpoint rule. The width of each piece is gonna look like B minus A over N or two over two or one. I kept the number simple, so probably you could just see that that middle was two. Now what's different than the midpoint rule is with trapezoids, rather than, rather than finding the midpoint and then looking at a single Y value, with our trapezoid rule, we're drawing in trapezoids by using the heights on both sides of each of our points. So if I were finding, oh, and just as a reminder of how you find the area of a trapezoid, the area of a trapezoid is equal to the base times the average of the two heights. So I would write that as like height one plus height two all over two. And since we have two of these, I'll just call that like T1 and T2. My second trapezoid would also have the base, but this one would be using the height at two plus the height at three all over two. We can certainly factor out the base. And then there are two different forms for the formula for trapezoid rule. And I'll show you both. They both would factor the base out, but then the question is what to do with the rest of these things. Um, and by the way, I've labeled these as like height one, height two, height three, but I could also think of that as F of one, F of two, and F of three in terms of those heights. So one option is actually to factor out the over two part also. And if I did that, if I factored out the base and the over two, I'd end up using the first height only once, but that second height, it gets used by both trapezoids. So it gets used twice. The last height only gets used once. The alternate formula for this doesn't factor out the one half, just has the base factored out. And that means that you end up taking half of the first height and then leaving the second height alone and then half of that last height. Now, as you add more, as you make your N larger, the only thing that happens is you're adding more of these points in the middle. 
but it really is just a formula. And the numbers to plug in are easier to find than with the midpoint because they're just straight up the numbers. Um, so when you break it apart into the widths, you're not then having to go back and calculate some other midpoint number. I think I'm going to call it there for the day, but does anyone have questions? We'll do more with this after. We'll do more with this on Wednesday. Yeah. Right, so if you're using this version of the formula, the first and the last don't get multiplied by two because they only get used once. But all of the values in between will get used by both trapezoids, like the one on the left of it and the one on the right of it. And I do have office hours um, on Zoom from two to three today. So you are totally welcome to stop by my office hours.